So thank you everyone for coming. It's wonderful to see you uh, here in Jaipur. And where better to have a conversation about the fall of the princely states. In the last few days, inevitably, you'll have walked around some of the beautiful old palaces that litter this wonderful city and, you know, seen all these, uh, seen all these signs and histories of these maharajas who once ruled this land. But often we forget that, you know, these were real monarchs with their own kingdoms. And we, we often forget to ask the question of, you know, how was this kingdom and 500 others absorbed into the Union of, the union of India that we know today? And so, John, I'd just like to start by asking you, you know, who were the princes? And why is, it, um, why is it that they're not here today? And why is it more important to remember them than just kind of people wearing lovely clothes and jewelry and palaces? They're much more important than that. So if you could just paint a picture. Sure, William. But first, I want to know why I didn't get a 21-gun salute as I walked in. <laughs> as, as your father promised, um, I have to have a chat to him about that. Yeah, look, we are in the heart of princely India here, or what was once princely India, Jaipur being, uh, uh, you know, the, the premier state of, of uh, what became Rajasthan. And yeah, it, it is, uh, the, the, the princely states have been largely left out of the narrative of India's uh, road to independence and what happened after. And my book, traces that road really from 1947 uh, through to the abolition of the privy purses, the end of the princely order in 1971 by a parliamentary decree uh, pushed by Indira Gandhi. And I also include what happened to the uh, dozen or so princely states that found themselves in the borders of uh, Pakistan, post-partition uh, Pakistan. But um, yeah, but, but just imagine this, there were 562 princely states. The, the big ones, Kashmir, uh, Hyderabad, 220,000 uh, square kilometers, uh, Hyderabad with uh, uh, 16 million people, an economy roughly equivalent to that of Belgium, down to micro states like Bilbari, which I think had an area roughly equivalent to the grounds of Clarks that we're sitting in now, and had a population less than the number of people in, in, uh, un, un, under this Shamiana. Um, and you had everything in between, and you had, uh, and, and it was, you know, you, you couldn't travel from, say, Delhi to uh, Chennai, Madras, uh, without passing through the territory of one of these princely states, except for a sliver of land, I think, near Jhansi. And it was the same going east to west. And they covered um, two-fifths of the subcontinent, uh, these princes ruled over a third of the population, so around about 100 million people at the time of, of independence. And, uh, and, and they, they were um, the British in their mania for uh, uh, you know, order um, uh, uh, devised a system of gun salutes, ranging from 21 down to 9. Um, and in, 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 they, they, they were roughly organized into something called the Chamber of Princes, uh, which was set up in 1921. And, uh, you know, the, 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 there was such a thunderous um, uh, noise when these, the trains carrying their prin these princes came into Delhi Station on a Sunday that uh, the authorities decreed that there should be no gun salutes on the Sunday, because it just, you know, <laughs> you could hear it across the whole city. So some of these princes waited in their trains until Monday, <laughs> so that when they, uh, their trains pulled in, uh, they'd get the uh, 21 guns or whatever it was that, that they thought they deserved. Um, yeah, and there were, look, we, we will talk about this later, uh, extremely good, enlightened rulers, um, the Maharaja of, of Jaipur being among them, uh, down to, yeah, that stereotypical, uh, dissolute, debauched uh, Raja or Maharaja who would spend his uh, uh, summers in the casinos of you know, Cannes and Deauville and all those places and, you know, the, the, the playboy types. The famous dogs of Junagar being among the the, 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 the dog <laughs> wedding of Junagar, where 
uh, a lot of the state treasury of Junagar in what's now Gujarat was spent on a massive dog wedding. Uh, he had two bobs. One was Bobby, who was imported from London. Bobby was a Labrador, and he was shipped all the way to India and arrived on an elephant, and there was a big wedding, and this was a huge, lavish affair to which the viceroys were supposedly in, uh, you know, invited, etc. So this is... Rather but but, but I, I heard a slightly different story about Junagad. So good, everyone knows where Junagad is. Uh, it's in, uh, in what is now Gujarat. And, and I'm sure we'll talk about the accession oh, yeah. of Junagad to Pakistan later. But when I was in Bombay just last week, I met... Uh, a lovely 90-year-old gentleman whose father had been the Surgeon General in Junagad at the time of um, uh, independence and accession. And he had a slightly different... He, he remembered the Nawab of Junagad, Mahabat Khan, driving around the city in a Hillman convertible with the windows up and little curtains there, driving around very slowly with his dogs following behind. <laughs> Um, and, and yes, look, you know, people say he, and, and he was eccentric, but he also, I mean, there's always two sides to, to these stories, but, you know, we, we now have the lions of Gear Forest, the fact that they're still there and they weren't hunted to extinction, because as we all know, the princes uh, loved hunting, um, is because of him, because he was a conservationist. He was the pioneer of all Indian nature reserves, in fact, yeah. and, you know, the, the love of dogs was linked to his love for animals, and some of the first um, nature reserves in all of India was established by the same family. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, I mean, I think, just to sort of pop in here, because uh, what is interesting is that, as you mentioned, there are two sides to every story, and the princes were among key players who actually began discussions for federalism mm. as a model for the post-colonial state. Yeah. I think that is also an interesting sort of binary to sort of look at, you know, because when we're talking about the princes and you mentioned that, the, you know, there are the debaucheries and there are dissolute rulers, etc. But they were also very erudite in their own ways as well. So, I mean, we'll talk about that later, obviously. But, I mean, I thought that was an interesting sort of flip side to the whole story as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, but what I, what I did want to sort of start you off with was also, you've laid out who the princes were. Let's cut to like 1947, Lord Mountbatten's arrived in India. Um, and I think the conventional narrative is often that, okay, India was divided into pa India and Pakistan. But the Ra British India wasn't a monolith, right? It was, as you say, 565 princely states. So can you lay out for us what the Raj was sort of looking at at the eve of transfer of power? What what were the considerations that it had? Yeah, um, Ma uh, Mountbatten, being a cousin of, of the king, wa and w was tasked with looking after Britain's most loyal allies, and these were the 562 states. Um, and it, you know, Lord Canning, who was the first viceroy of India, uh, famously wrote that uh, had it not been for the princely states, the, uh, the, the uprising of 1857 would have swept us away. It was the fact that important states like Hyderabad uh, in the south uh, remained loyal, uh, that, there was, that they prevented the citizens of that state, the Nizam prevented the citizens of that state from joining the mutiny, or the sepoys there, that uh, you know, the tide didn't turn against, against the English. So they, in um, uh, 1858, Queen Victoria uh, issues a proclamation declaring that these uh, states, many of them had treaties with Britain, that these treaties were invi in invaluable, that they would never be uh, rescinded. Um, that they were, that they became during the nationalist period uh, seen as Britain's most loyal allies, as, as, a, as a counterweight to Congress and then the Muslim League too. Um, yeah, but but when, when Mountain Batten came to India, his first priority was not to deal with the question of what would happen to these 500. 62 princely states because he had bigger problems. India was, you know, was, you know, um, Hindu Muslim um, tensions. There was still no plan to partition India. Uh, it, you know, things were uh, on a knife edge. On the verge of civil war. On the, on the verge of civil war, exactly, yeah. Um, and it was only 
really by in June or July that uh, we've only, you know, he'd brought forward the, the, the date for Britain's departure from India. And it was only uh, in, in late June that he really decided to address the problem of what to do about the princely states. And uh, it, what is remarkable is that it was only on July the 25th, 1947, just three weeks before uh, Britain was due to transfer power, that Mountbatten addressed the Chamber of, of Princes and handed them instruments of accession, which they had to sign, or that, well, they were asked to sign, but you know, they, they were pretty much left with no choice. So in just a matter of three weeks, Mountbatten, Vallabhai Patel, and VP Menon, we'll be talking about all these uh, individuals in turn, managed to get almost all of these states to accede to the Indian Union. And that is, that's incredible. And if they hadn't, uh, you would have, it, decades of nationalist struggle would have literally gone up in smoke. You would have had a balkanized India. You would have had these little islands of autocracy scattered around the place. It would have been ungovernable. It would have been a disaster. And I mean, when we're talking about that, Sam, uh, you know, Cyril Radcliffe's arriving in India and also in July 1947. Uh, and something I think that we all miss is Cyril Radcliffe didn't actually draw the Radcliffe line like that. It was actually sort of done by 30 Maharajas who fell within that line. So sure. can you lay that out for us? I don't sure. think... Um, so in On the Verge of Partition, the idea that there will now... The, the idea comes in the summer of 1947 that the British cannot hand over power to just one government. They now have to hand it over to two, India and Pakistan. And the two respective governments are... The, the, the kind of communications are so poisonous at this point that Mountbatten um, brings in uh, a man called Cyril Radcliffe from Britain who's uh, famously never been east of Paris um, to draw the border between India and Pakistan, which it said he won't be biased because anyone who actually knows the situation will always have a bias one way or the other. This, it goes without saying, proved a terrible disaster. Um, but one of the things through my research that I found most interesting is that actually a small minority of the India-Pakistan and India-Bangladesh borders was ever actually drawn by him. He was only tasked with drawing the partitions of specific provinces. So he drew the line between East Punjab and West Punjab, and between East Bengal and West Bengal. But for the vast majority of the western border, which goes all the way through Rajasthan, uh, down through Gujarat, down to the Arabian Sea, it was these princes who were given instruments of accession not just by um, not just by the Congress, not just by the Indian government, but also by the Pakistani government. And they had the option, in most cases, these kind of 30 or so border states to go, maybe I want to join India, maybe I want to join Pakistan. And what I find fascinating is that only one of the border princes uh, unilaterally knew what he wanted to join before time. And that was the Maharaja of Bikaneer, who was certain from the very earliest time that he was going to join India. But for example, Jodhpur, the lovely blue city that I'm sure many of you here have been to, um, Jin, uh, the Maharaja of Jodhpur approached the government of Pakistan to say, what can you offer me? Likewise, a lot of the, um, a lot of the states that are now part of Pakistan, Pavalpur and Kherpur, both approached Nehru to say, what can you do for us? And in fact, many of the states in what's now Meghalaya in the Northeast, they were Christian states, and so they were neither Hindu nor Muslim. And so there's evidence that, you know, uh, letters were sent to Pakistan to say, what can you offer me? But that p the government of Pakistan was in such turmoil at this point that they actually lost the letter. Mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, one wonders whether the whole of Meghalaya, Shillong, all these cities would be part of, Pakistan, uh, would be part of Bangladesh today if that were the case. Manipur, the entire state of Manipur, the Maharaja never actively wanted to do this, but there was a strong movement there that we should be joining Burma rather than India because it was always Manipuri Brahmins uh, who performed at the coronations of the Burmese Empire. And actually, if you look throughout the history of the Burmese Empire, Manipur was part of um, the Burmese Empire is far more often 
ruled from Rangoon than Delhi. Um, so there's all these fascinating uh, kind of go-betweens. But yeah. quickly back to... Yeah. Oh, no, I just wanted to add something about Jodhpur, which is, it's interesting. I mean, how many people here knew that Jodhpur um, toyed with the idea of joining Pakistan? Um, so basically, Jinnah handed out blank sheets of paper to rulers such as um, Han, Han Wan Singh of, of, uh, of Jodhpur, uh, Hamidullah Khan, um, even, even uh, Yeshwant Rao of Indore, were all, he, he tried to coax them all to become part of India. And he imagined what, what, what um, and this would have created what Patel described as a dagger into the very heart of India. Because imagine you had Jodhpur, he was, Jinnah was also hoping that Udaipur might uh, might join this kind of uh, confederation, as well as uh, Bhopal and Indore. You would have had this sort of dagger in, uh, uh, um, uh, stabbing the heart of India. But the Jodhpur story has got a nice twist because even after Han Wan Singh uh, signed the instrument of accession, he famously confronted your grandfather, VP Menon, with a 22 caliber revolver <laughs> that, 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 that he had made in his magic props workshop because Han Wan Singh was also a member of the magic circle in London. And uh, um, yeah. Mountbatten uh, yeah, was also part of the same uh, magic, uh, magic society, fraternity. by the way. They're all kind of very into magic on the side, which yeah, is a rather wonderful yeah. little historical detail. <laughs> detail. And, and, this, and this pen <laughs> actually found its way into the museum of the magic yeah, circles. <laughs> um, so, I mean, on that note, I think, you know, there are basically three men um, who we can kind of, you know, thank or hate or whatever you are, depending on which country you're from and how, what side of the political divide you fell. But the three men who basically brought around what is without a doubt one of the great revolutions in world history. I mean, you know, we talk about the Russian Revolution, which is, you know, one, uh, one entire aristocracy that falls apart. But 600, uh, you know, uh, 500 plus aristocracies were wiped from the map in the course of a year and a half. And we'll be getting onto the question of whether this was a bloodless revolution a bit later. But I think it's important to start talking about who these people were. We talked about Mountbatten, cousin of the king, a uh, big high society man in London, uh, you know, war hero from World War II, who was, uh, you know, whose um, a, a film about his life had already been made that was the runner-up in the Oscars that year to Casablanca. Um, but whether that was him basically kind of changing the narrative slightly and making himself into a war hero, who was great at kind of bigging himself up, wasn't he? But one of the other men was your great-grandfather. And th so I think it's time that we address I'm, I'm that we have here, the granddaughter please. of one of the men who made modern India in the room, yeah. um, Narani Bas. <laughs> So why don't you talk about how you discovered his life? Um, I discovered his life by virtue of being um, a history student. So I was, uh, because, I mean, this sounds weird, but my family never really spoke about uh, VP Menon per se. So I didn't grow up listening to stories about VP. Uh, but I was a history student uh, in college, and nearly everything that you read about, v about modern India, especially the summer of 1947, uh, there is always this line about VP Menon uh, with Mountbatten's capable reforms commissioner, Sardar Patel's right-hand man. He's in and out in under two sentences in any book that you might read on modern India. Um, I was very curious. Uh, I googled. There was nothing. There was no book that I could refer to apart from, obviously, his two seminal books on transfer of power and the integration of the Indian states. But none of those books ever told me about who he was. Uh, they're very, I mean, they're very dry, factual sort of recounting of uh, things as they happened back then, um, which is how I came to sort of digging around uh, in the archives for who he was, where he started out, because so far as I could see from the public domain, uh, his government career was between 47 to about 51 when the state's Ministry of State sort of shut down. Um, I actually came across the first earliest evidence of his existence in government, uh, dated to 1914, which is when he is a very young man. He is sort of, sort of a temporary guy. And sort of to contextualize this, he is also somebody who never sat for the ICS examinations, which you had to sit for in those days. He came from a village in Kerala. 
uh, he ran away from home after having burnt down his school, which, which is true. Uh, I thought it was uh, something that uh, you know you made up, but it was actually true. Um, he goes to work in the Kolar gold mines where he's a coolie for a number of years, and then he sort of hopscotches his way across India, uh, finds himself in New Delhi with just a letter from a government official uh, recommending that he start work in the government of India as a typist, which is what he did. Um, and essentially speaking, when I found this uh, scrap of paper, it was in his own writing. It's dated to 1914. And that is when I discovered, and he's basically asking the Home Department whether he could continue working for them in some capacity because he never really wanted to go back home until he had made something of himself, uh, which as it turned out, he did. Um, and that was my first clue that this is a guy who spent uh, you know, over three decades in government service. His, his time in government service spanned the, almost the entire length and breadth of the freedom movement. Um, and he's intimately involved with uh, the reforms branch right from its inception. Uh, it began in 1917. Um, and he continued with the reforms department right until he joined the Ministry of States in 1947. Um, and he's the guy who drafted the prototype of the instrument of accession. His signature is on every instrument of accession there is. Um, he is the guy who drafted our Indian Independence Act. Um, he basically worked his way up from being a typist to becoming one of our highest civil servants. And I thought his story was remarkable um, because he, had to, he basically learnt on the job. And this is somebody who, as in John's book, becomes you know, such a key figure in pulling 565 princely states together. And that is how I chanced upon the story, uh, which sort of leads me into my question to you. How did you come across this? And you know, what <laughs> pulled you towards this? Well, your magnificent book, Narayani, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> um, but, but look, you know, up, up until then, I mean, uh, VP Menon's book on the integration of the princely states was really the standard work. It was sort of the, kind of like the last word yeah. almost on, on the integration. Um, you have a vast corpus of papers uh, in, you know, you can find on that Sartar Patel uh, left behind, which discussed the integration of the states as well. But it was, you know, your, your grandfather's uh, work, which was, of course, my starting point. But, but the... Um, it was, uh, look, you know, he's, he's writing from his own perspective, he's giving his own yeah. spin on things, and in fact we know um, uh, uh, th there's also a remarkable collection of tape recordings that V.P. Menon yes. uh, made with H.V. Hodson, who was the Reforms Commissioner under Lord Lin Linlithgow, and Linlith um, Hodson Wait, was the one who recommended that uh, uh, V.P. Menon take over after he left. Um, and and in, the, in those tape recordings, he's much more frank about what happened. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So if it wasn't for those, so that's kind of like a postscript, which anybody who's, who's uh, interested in, in the princely states and what happened and how it all happened has yeah. really got, got to refer to. But yes, I mean, w what a remarkable character. I mean, as you say, working his way up from being a coolie in the gold mines of Kolar to the most senior position ever held by an Indian in the British in the British Raj, it's it's a and a self-made man too, you know, doing it all by chutzpah, you know, just <laughs> chance and and confidence, you know, just just it, it is a remarkable story. Um, so Menon is even these days you you mention uh, Menon and people think of Krishna Menon, indeed, yeah, yes, which which hopefully will not be the case too much <laughs> longer, but uh, yeah. yeah. I, I also think it's worth mentioning how many of the other kind of great leaders of the freedom movement on both sides in India and in Pakistan um, were aristocrats, um, yeah. and how you know unusual a background like that was at the time. You know, even Extremely Gandhi, unusual, even yeah. Gandhi's, uh, I think his father or grandfather was uh, the prime minister of Porbandar state. Again, a princely state. He had a princely background. Um, you know, ne the Nehrus were some of the great aristocrats of, of Allahabad. Jinnah was had loved his Savile Row suits and kind of you know rode about around Malabar Hill in Bombay. Um, and so this was a very unlikely background. Um, but it was also a changing order as you came towards transfer of power and integration, right? So, I mean, nothing was, as both of you mentioned towards the start of this session, uh, nothing was clear cut going forward. You know, you had transfer of power, uh, partition was definite uh, by the summer of 1947. And yet there were 
states, the big states, Kashmir, Hyderabad, Junagar, yeah. uh, which were, it wasn't, it wasn't clear where they would I, I, Exactly. Go. I mean, the Indip India independence, I gave all these states I mean, to the, the, the option of uh, joining India, joining Pakistan, or becoming independent. The treaties that the British had signed with not all of the states, but a, 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 quite a number of them, would lapse. What would happen then? Technically speaking, if Travancore had remained an independent state, as it, it, it tried to do at one point, and we can get to that later, it could have, there was nothing to stop it importing British arms and yeah. creating its own post-independence army. Um, as you know, Hyderabad tried to do in, in its brief uh, time as an independent state. So it, you know, it would have been uh, you know, and, and we should also talk about these instruments of accession that uh, VP Menon came up with. So basically, the princes uh, were asked to sign on the dotted line. Um, some did so willingly uh, because they recognised that there was no future for them um, as independent entities. Many were just too small. Uh, you know, for that to become viable. Do you think that was because largely uh, popular movements were growing within the states or yeah. larger geopolitical considerations? The, what do you it, think? It was a mixture of both. It was a mixture of both, yeah. Some of the, some of the rulers feared that they would be overthrown um, by their own populace, which is what, what, what Mountbatten, when he stood before the Chamber of Princes on July 25th, warned them uh, against. And Patel warned them of this as well, as did Nehru. They kept reminding these princes that if you don't uh, accede to, and if you don't join India, your days are numbered. And uh, and I, I think I think sort of just to sort of uh, contextualize that, because, you know, when we think about uh, integration, we tend to think of it as starting in 1947. But I think your book also highlights the really important fact that it was actually the result of a long process. Mm. These were discussions that had started as early as the mid-1920s, mm. right? And so it's 1947, with its larger sort of background, is sort of the culmination of yeah. a long process, right? Yeah. So yeah, can that's you talk right. about, a bit about that too? Yeah, it was a combination of a long process. Um, yeah, as you said, the princes, there, 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 were, there was a push in the 1930s to form a federation where the princes would have uh, their own chamber in, in, in a constituent assembly and so on. Um, that never um, gained much traction. The problem with the princely states was that these rulers had no, they, 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 they didn't know how to cooperate among themselves, the, 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 was, which was partly as a result of the system that the British devised, uh, which meant that they were not allowed to actually have relations with each other. It all had to go through the crown. Um, and there was a system of political agents and residents and so on who were their supposed advisors and were supposed to keep them in check. Um, so, so the princes were divided. They were divided from the moment the Chamber of Princes was, was formed up until 1947, and then when, when they belatedly tried to form a sort of common front against Indira Gandhi's push to abolish the proof purses, that would fail as well. So they, they, were, they could never form a common front. But um, yeah, yeah. So I think, <clears throat> I mean, Narayani mentioned earlier about the three states uh, that proved most unwilling to join one way or the other. And these were Kashmir, Hyderabad, and Junagar. And it really came down, I think, to a question of whose decision should it be? We mentioned um, that there were increasing political um, groups growing in these states. And they wanted a voice too. And they didn't want it to just be the Maharaja or Sultan or Nawab's choice over which side to join. So, um, I mean, let's begin with Junagar. Where okay. you just met, and yeah, yeah. okay. So if, if you um, if if you were to purchase a map of Pakistan, you probably wouldn't be able to purchase one in in India. <laughs> An official map of Pakistan today will still show Junagadh as part of Pakistan. There's a green blob at the bottom of... of in the middle uh, of Gujarat. In the middle of Gujarat. <laughs> so, okay, here's this state move, uh, ruled over by this rather eccentric Nawab. But, but the Diwan, the important thing is that the Diwan of this state, Shah Nawaz Bhutto, the father of Zufika Ali Bhutto, um, is the one who's really pushing for... Uh, uh, Junagadh to accede to Pakistan, to basically exercise its legal right uh, to choose which dominion it should join. Um, so 
um, Junagad, uh, you know, finally most states sign their instruments of accession. A few of them are wavering until literally a few mi a minutes before midnight of, of, uh, of August the 15th. But there's no instrument uh, forthcoming from Junagad. It's only the next day through a, a press release that the uh, Indians realize that Junagad has decided to accede to Pakistan. Pakistan, though, Jinnah, who's got lots of problems on his hand, ignores this for about a month and then finally accepts Junagad's accession to Pakistan, which is probably the last thing he wants, actually. Um, but, um, yeah, it, it's what then that's, um, of course, this is a particularly uh, worrisome, well, Patel being a Gujarati, he's the one who's really pushes most strongly for India to use force to rein Junagad back in. Junagad is uh, a state with a sort of 15% Muslim population and an 85% Hindu population, as was the case with most of the Muslim ruled states in India. Muslim minority uh, ruling over a Hindu majority, the opposite in Kashmir, we can talk about that later. Um, so, th there, so India masses its troops on the border. Um, uh, Nehru, of course, is uh, being the pacifist he is, is wavering, saying, "No, no, no, we can't uh, use force. This is a sovereign country. I mean, they've, they've made, you know, it's, it's a sovereign state. We can't invade." But Patel is the one who finally pushes for. And I, I, I think you know, often this is this story is told through kind of you know as a little kind of quirky anecdote added on to the stories of Kashmir and Hyderabad, and we forget quite how contentious it was, mm. and the absolutely massive refugee crisis that followed this, you know, huge numbers of Muslims streaming from what's now Gujarat into what's now Sindh in Pakistan, huge numbers of displaced um, Hindus who flee that, you know, think that Pakistan is about to invade and um, or send an army in rather. And so huge numbers of Hindus fleeing from the state. And this is a, the area, by the way, that has the, both the Somnath temples and the Dwarka temples. This is, these are two of the most holy places in the Hindu faith and several of the most holy places in the Jain faith as well. Um, Girnaji being the most obvious, uh, which is right by the capital. So and, and also the other thing is that India doesn't want to set a precedence. Um, if mm. Junagadh is allowed to remain yeah. uh, part of Pakistan, what about Kashmir? Yeah. <laughs> Let's move Absolutely. on to that. Absolutely. Uh, so as in Kashmir, uh, or uh, let's start with Kashmir. Um, Kashmir is the opposite. There's a Hindu Maharaja, it's Muslim majority state. And I think Bhutto's argument for Junagar to join Pakistan, I think what a lot of, there's, there's, there's differences of opinion here, but some people think that he's basically looking that if he can get them to push a plebiscite on Junagar um, and make sure that basically there's a vote, it's Hindu majority, it will join India, then the same thing will have to happen in Kashmir. And so, I mean, yeah, why don't you? I, exactly, exactly. And then, and then meanwhile, the, the problem of what's going to happen in Hyderabad is brewing as well. Hyderabad's Hindu majority with a Muslim ruler. Yeah, exactly. No, no, I, okay. So, um, yeah. Well, look, the, 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 the question of what happened in, in Kashmir, the, the chronology of events, everything that there is still very contentious today. But, then, but, but everybody here, I'm sure, knows the story that there was a tribal rebellion uh, a, 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 a incursion by tribal rebels into Kashmir. Uh, how much that was uh, engineered and directed by the Pakistan, the, this, this new fledgling Pakistani state is debatable. But the fact is that this, these tribal militia suddenly were at the gates of Srinagar and the Maharaja was wavering as to whether to sign an instrument of accession to become part of India. He was under tremendous pressure to do so, particularly from Nehru. Your grandfather uh, meets with the Maharaja just uh, the day before, I think, this yeah. happens. And it's a, it's a, you, you should continue the story here. No, I think here. you should. <laughs> <laughs> this is Needle no, no. Needless to say, basically, yeah, the, ma the origins of so many of the conflicts which plague uh, the Indian subcontinent today, the, you know, the uh, India and Pakistan dispute over Kashmir, the, um, the uh, insurgency that goes on in Balochistan in modern-day Pakistan is yet another of these conflicts that have their origins in the integration of the princely states. Did 
but you know, there was a parliament in the uh, Kalat state that wanted to be to remain independent and outside of the Pakistani yeah, yeah, yeah. Union, and yeah. the hands were forced once again. And yeah, yeah. I mean, the drama in this whole story is incredible. You know, you, you, you've got you know VP Menon uh, meeting with uh, Harry Singh, uh, coming back to Delhi on the 26th of, of October, um, walking into uh, a, a meeting of the Defence Committee. Committee. Nehru's there, Baldev Singh, the Defence Minister, is there. Um, Patel is there um, and saying, you know, all our invaders have come in from the north. Today it's Srinagar, Chalo. Tomorrow it'll be Delhi, Chalo. And there you have Manikshaw, Patel, Nehru, um, uh, Nehru differing over what should be done. I mean, he does, you know, he's saying, no, 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 we don't have an instrument of accession. Um, you know, we, 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 can't be, we can't send the troops in. That would be seen as an act of war. And, and Patel basically going, do you want to keep Kashmir or do you want to lose Kashmir? And Nehru goes, of course I want to keep Kashmir. And he turns to Manik Shaw and says, you've got your orders, send in the troops. This is the thing, you know, because what we we sit here in 2024 and we talk about this absolutely amazing, insane time in history. And events were just happening by the millisecond, practically, right? You had to make these decisions or lose big chunks of this country. Um, and when we look at that uh, and you look at also the fact that integration wasn't always, I mean, these are the stories that dominate public imagination, right? Kashmir, Hyderabad, Junagar, the big three. Uh, but there, it wasn't all military conflict. There was also a lot of diplomacy involved, right? These guys also had to use charm and diplomacy in order to get certain rulers to sign the instrument of accession. It wasn't always coercion. Coercion was there, for sure. Uh, you know, you had Sardar Patel telling the Nawab of Bhopal, it would be better if you give us the rights rather than forcing us to take over the rights. You know, and it was, it's, a sort of, it's not even an implicit threat, it's, it's right there, right? Uh, but you also had like these series of lunches and dinners that were happening between Sardar Patel and the princes, major princes. There would, there would be this sort of charm offensive, which is the last thing you associate with Sardar Patel, right? But he did go on a big charm offensive with a lot of the princes in order to get them to come around to the idea of signing on the dotted line, yeah. so to speak. So, so Sardar Patel becomes the uh, uh, Minister of States, like the, there's a new States Department formed, uh, and Menon is his deputy. And uh, Patel, and, and the other main player, Nehru, of course, he just, he despised the States, which is, the, the, which his you know, daughter, Indira, inherited this, this hatred of, of the princes. Um, but uh, it was Patel, yeah, it, he used his charm. He was very diplomatic uh, in his approach to the princes and he, you know, tried to, uh, you know, he urged them, remember, remember, you know, you, it, you, you are like, um, you know, patriotic, you know, he tried, you know, instill this sort of sense of patriotism in them and, and urge them to, to join the Indian Union. And, and today, um, you know, you talk to the descendants of these uh, Maharajas or Nawabs and Rajas, and they don't see Patel as the villain, even though he was the one who really, either through um, polite persuasion or sometimes arm twisting or sometimes, you know, show or use of force, got these states into the Indian Union. They don't see him as the villain. They see Indira Gandhi as yeah. the villain. Yeah. And because Patel also, um, he was the one that insisted that these, that the princely privileges, their privy purses, etc., be enshrined in the constitution. Something which Nehru didn't want. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. One of the most fascinating bits about both of your books um, have been these <clears throat> incredible stories that you pulled in, uh, pulled out from the archives. Some of which had never really been. Um, like I'd never heard of before. So, for example, I think it's Bilaspur you write about in your book, the small state in Himachal Pradesh that long after every other state has had to, um, you know, sign one, sign and accede to one country or the other, Bilaspur, a, a collection of tiny villages um, in what's now Himachal Pradesh, was still holding out. Yeah, uh, with, the, with, the, with the Maharaja, uh, I think it was about a nine-gun salute state, you know, claiming quite rightly, like, we, you know, we, we, we have this long, proud heritage, you know, it goes back centuries, if not that, yeah. But it, it, look, it, it, Patel famously said um, that this was a bloodless revolution, getting these states to come along. 
uh, and a seed. But um, I think what my book shows is that it was far messier than that. I mean, I mean, you had, I mean, Patel was terrified that the Rajput states would accede to Pakistan because the Rajputs hated Congress. <laughs> yeah, you had the Jat rulers of Alwar and Bharatpur, you know, dreaming of an independent Jatistan. You had the Mios in those states wanting to create their own Mio-stan, yes. the Muslim uh, minority there. Uh, and you had this, these, yeah, Bilaspur, you had Travancore, you had um, uh, Radhampur in, in Gujarat and, and others. I mean, you had, had a state like Dujana, which is not that far from Delhi. The, uh, uh, the, the, the Nawab there um, offered to accede to Pakistan. Jinnah ignored it, ignored his... The only state to be rejected from joining Pakistan. <laughs> state to be rejected. And in the middle of Haryana, 30 kilometers from Gurgaon. Yeah. And you can visit it if you're ever in Delhi. Very much worth a visit. Utterly fascinating town. It's this old walled city, collection of maybe 40 villages. You know, it, it wasn't like Jaipur state. It didn't have all this grandeur. It was a tiny, tiny thing that through having basically signed an alliance with the British had maintained their independence until this late time. But... Um, yeah, I mean, you go there today and there were all these riots. P um, when I was there interviewing someone a year ago, they were saying how, you know, people always say that partition was medieval. There were mobs attacking the town and we moved into the old walled fortress and were firing medieval cannons down. Um, and, you know, it was a full... Um, and so he tries to join Pakistan in that moment and is rejected for having no airstrip. There's no way for Pakistan to actually get there. Um, Can and so I, eventually, yeah. Sorry, just to sort of come in with the fact that uh, I think before we sort of open it up for questions, questions yeah. is, is that it also had a bizarre moments that you sort of pull out from the archives, right? Like you have, uh, there's this contingent of ducks that's been ordered by the Calcutta government in July 1947, right? So because, I mean, this was all part of, it became part of sort of partition discourse because at that point the ducks arrived. It, it cost the government 250 pounds. Ducks as in birds. Du ducks as in birds, like this whole <laughs> contingent of ducks. Um, and because you had partition in the air, Bengal was going to be divided, yeah. um, they didn't know what to do with the ducks, you know, and it became the finance secretary refused to pay for the ducks because the finance secretary said, look, I mean, we have bigger things to think about than paying for a contingent of ducks. So the ducks were packed off to a warehouse while there became, there's this huge paper trail just about what to do with ducks. What happened, right. what happened to the ducks? We need to know. Nobody knows what happens to the ducks. We don't know what happened to the ducks. We don't know what this happened to the Narayan. ducks. <laughs> right? Uh, exactly. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's bizarre stuff in the archives also, apart from the really serious stuff about, uh, you know, yeah. getting princes and sovereignty and uh, all of that, federalism, etc. But there's also stuff as trivial as ducks and printing yeah. presses and chairs. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I think we have about se um, seven minutes for questions, so please raise your hands. Um, lady in the front, over here. Do we have a microphone, anyone? Lady in the front. Uh, very informative session, thank you very much. I am myself a victim of partition, so I would like to ask you two questions. Could partition have been avoided, number one? And number two, who was responsible to divide India? Was it the Britishers' idea? Or was there any conflict between Hindus and Muslims, which I don't think there was, because I came from that. And we used to live in peace, always. Well, that's a, such a huge question. We could devote a whole session to it. But I mean, your grandfather, again, was the architect of the partition plan. Uh, well, I mean, you know, uh, he was never in favor of partition. That, I think that's an important thing to remember. Nobody was really in favor of partition. Uh, I think so much of it was uh, dominated a lot by circumstance and by how things were playing out in terms of discussions between Gandhi and Jinnah, Jinnah and the Congress. Uh, all of that boiled down to what you could get and what you had to sort of push for. Nobody was in favor of partition, and that's, that's unfortunately the sad, of, sad reality. There are, on, the, on, the second, on the second point, I think there, there were several plans which, um, you know, yeah. the cabinet mission plan being the most obvious, which provided, which are very tantalizing because they provided Pakistan as a region of a united India. So there would be these, just like you have the United Kingdom, you have kind of, um, you know, England, Scotland, Wales, uh, Northern Ireland, 
I think you know, there was a plan that would have had a East Pakistan, a West Pakistan, a North India, Central India, South India as part of one united federation. Um, and there are several other plans which at various Second, second on this row. Thank you so much, guys. It's been a brilliant talk. So I was interested in, obviously, once they signed their instrument of assent, uh, um, you had mentioned that some of the princely states, there was a lot of the public was quite for that. Were there any princely states where the public had a sense of loyalty to them, and how did they manage that after partition? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, Congress it, itself um, urged the princes to put their fate into the hands of their subjects. You know, if, if you're good enough to be a ruler, your subjects should recognize that by, you know, you, know, you, you, you uh, have elections um, and, you know, you put yourselves up as candidates and if you're good enough to be rulers, then, then do so. So there were states that were very well ruled and I would say that the populations probably, you know, that the subjects of those states would have uh, wanted their rulers to continue uh, in power. Jaipur arguably being one, Baroda being another. Um, Rampur and, R and Pudakatai were the two yeah, others. Uh, Nawanaga and, and so on, yeah. There are several of them. Um, yes, uh, back, at, back, back left, just hand raised, yes. Sir, I wanted to ask that uh, uh, the Britishers who write these, uh, uh, these history books about modern India, they tend to, uh, <coughs> sorry, they tend to favor Mountbatten and his policies much and uh, uh, they tend to like disregard the work uh, which Gandhi done uh, for, the, for the Indian independence and they also don't shed light on the, uh, uh, the bad realities of Mountbatten and Nehru uh, and those kind of things. So why, why is it uh, so? Like, why they don't show uh, the reality of Mountbatten's? I think there's several very good um, books. I mean, it depends who, who you're reading, and I'm not. I mean, we can we can we can speak about this afterwards. But I think that there's a very wide number of interpretations of Mountbatten from kind of complete hagiographies who think he did absolutely brilliantly, and I think certainly a lot of the early 1950s work said that. But I think since then, particularly after the 1980s, there's been a lot of work. Um, the sort of more revisionist work that's taken away from that uh, step and looks m more closely and more critically at his work from Britain. Um, so, I mean, we can chat about that later and I'm happy to speak. Do, do you have anything else to add? No, no, not note? really. Maybe more questions. Um. Yes. We've got two minutes left. So my parents have migrated from uh, Pakistan. I just want to know two things. One was the Balochistan was not part of uh, erstwhile India. And same, another thing with Northwest Frontier Powerance, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, they I think probably wanted to join in India. So what happened to these two princely states, yeah. Northwest Frontier Province and Balochistan? Okay, yeah, very so, quickly, um, Pakistan had a, only had about a dozen princely states uh, within its boundaries, uh, Kalat being the largest one. It was one of the, if you looked at British India as a whole, it would have been one of the largest of the states. So Jinnah didn't bother with drawing up instruments of accession until after independence believing that it would be, you know, an easy ride. And uh, um, Kalat saw itself as being in, uh, saw itself as being different than the other states, having different treaty arrangements. It saw itself equivalent, you know, as being similar to Nepal, so a sovereign state. So it declared its independence um, after August 14th, um, which Jinnah initially accepted, and then realized that, hey, maybe this is not the best uh, situation we, you know, to have. To okay, we're, uh, but we're, we're uh, 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 just to wrap it up. I mean, yes, um, it, you know, Kalat eventually was forced to accede to Pakistan, um, uh, and through the threat of force, um, and uh, and again, um, despite the fact that its own 
uh, elected assembly had agreed with, uh, had, had um, uh, objected to, to the accession. So that is the root of the Balochistan problem today, is we were forced against our will to accede to Pakistan, and you know, Baluch nationalism still centers on that, what they see as a historical wrong. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This was a fantastic session. Thank you, John, for talking about your amazing thank book. Thank you, both of you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Sam. Thank you, thank you both. This was wonderful. <laughs>